So in this case, we're saying the color is pale valid red and the font size is 24 pixels. So in the end, what we get is a title React component that will render an H1 that will have a color of pale valid red and the font size of 24 pixels. And then we use that React component just like any other React component with our JSX in our React. That is sort of a quick example of what CSS and JS looks like. Now, look at, the, look at your screen and don't blink because there's gonna be a quick animation into how this actually works. If you look at your screen right now, what, what happens under the hood is that we take that CSS and we create a completely unique hashed class name for your CSS and inject it into the DOM. So we create a style tag in the DOM and we inject this CSS into it. We generate this completely unique class name, which avoids, which means you never have any class name classes, uh, clashes. And then we render an H1, like I said, with that unique class name applied. So far so good. That's sort of how CSS and JS works. You write your CSS in JavaScript and then we inject it into the DOM. Now, why would you ever even use CSS and JS? I, I sort of personally have five reasons why I really like it. The first is confidence. I can add, change, and delete CSS without any unexpected consequences. Because every class name is unique and because everything is sculpted to a component, if I add CSS, I know it's only ever going to affect that component. If I change CSS, I know it's only ever going to affect that component. If I delete a component, I also automatically delete its CSS with it, right? There's no way to end up with dead CSS, which is huge for maintenance. If you've ever worked in a big front-end code base, you'll have likely run into append-only style sheets, right? Where you have your style sheet, and whether that's a SAS file or a CSS file or many SAS files, and usually what, I have, what ends up happening in big applications is that you only really add stuff at the end because you have thousands of pages and you don't know which part of your CSS is used and unused throughout your website. And so with, with CSS and JS, you can just delete that's any CSS and add to it without ever worrying about what this will affect, which is really huge for maintenance. That in turn is really important for teamwork because essentially any developer can work on the styling and can work on the UI without necessarily having to have the deepest understanding of CSS. If you have a junior or front-end developer on your team that might not have the 10, levels of ex the 10 years of experience that you have with CSS, they can still write CSS and you're automatically going to avoid a bunch of common problems with bad CSS, like class name clashes and, like I said, append-only style sheets. And don't get me started about specificity wars. Uh, you won't have any of those anymore. Now, the next point is one that many people don't initially understand. CSS and JS actually has really fast performance. And the reason for that is that we know which components you actually use on a page, right? Because we know which components are actually used on a page, we only ever inject their CSS. That means out of the box, without any extra configuration, any brittle tooling, repeatedly and automatically, you get critical CSS, right? Only the critical CSS for the current page that is currently rendered will be injected to the DOM. This is important for client-side rendering, but it's even more important for server-side or static rendering. If you're server-side or statically rendering your React app, those pages, those HTML files, will only contain the critical CSS. How huge is that? You could have a completely dynamic site that is server-side rendered that with authentication, anything you want, and the CSS payload, payload that you sent over the wire is the most minimal CSS payload for that specific user possible. Every single user will only load the necessary code, not more and not less, which is huge. Literally, no other tool can do that. And then the fifth one, which is one that I personally also use, but not as much, is dynamic styling. Some people have really good use cases for this, like highly dynamic theming. If you're doing any white labeling sort of thing, you can have highly dynamic styling from data fetched from a server and blah, 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 blah. I don't personally use this, but it's something that's make, that CSS and JS makes really, really, really easy. Overall, to me, what CSS in JS really does is it guides me to the pit of success, right? It sort of guides me towards doing things the right way by default. It guides me towards avoiding a bunch of common frustrations. Now, you can still write shit code, okay? If you write shit code, it's going to be shit code, no matter which framework you use. If it's bad code, it doesn't matter, right? But at least with CSS in JS, you can avoid a bunch of common problems and not have those anymore. And then Again, if you write bad code, you write bad code and that's that. But at least you won't write bad code in those five ways I said. Or however many of those were, I didn't actually count them. Now, CSS is US, where are we at? I want to talk about the present before I talk about the past and the future. CSS and JS has really, really overtaken the React world, specifically. 
Now, when I first made the slide deck, which must have been a couple of months ago, 60% of React installs also installed a CSS and JS library. I recently recomputed the stat, um, and since then, it's actually 95% of React installs that also install a CSS and JS library. That is not counting CSS modules, which is another very big framework that many people use. CSS and JS is absolutely massive. It is widely used throughout the entire industry. There's many, many big websites using CSS and JS. I once calculated that my own library style components, probably around two thirds to three quarters of all internet users have ever visited the website that used style components, which is insane. That's just one library out of the many that we're gonna talk about. That's not because I'm flaunting my own library, but just because that's the one I thought about based on all the users I know we have. Um, sorry if that comes off as flexing, that wasn't the point of this. So let's talk about the past real quick. It all really started in November of 2014. Oleg uh, from Berlin launched the, ever, the very first ever CSS and JS library called JSS. Now, JSS was years ahead of its time. To this date, we're finding things in JSS that all the other libraries copy that Oleg had already thought about six years ago now, which is absolutely incredible. At the time, nobody really knew about JSS though because nobody really knew that CSS and JS was even a thing that was possible. That happened in the same month that sort of first initial conversation got kicked off by Ed Vigeux, who is on the, or who's, who's one of the managers of the React team at Facebook. Um, and he gave a talk in Washington DC at NationJS at a small conference where he talked about how Facebook uses CSS and JS. If you've ever heard about CSS and JS, you've likely seen a screenshot of one of the slides from that talk. Now, that talk kicked off a literal shitstorm in the Twitter sphere. Everybody went bananas talking about what the fuck Facebook is doing and how they're complete idiots. Literally, it was one of the biggest shitstorms at the time in the React community. Everybody just thought it was the worst idea ever. But what it really did was it it sort of pushed that concept even to the forefront. It made people even consider the possibility that that is something they could be doing. And so from that point onward, we got rapid innovation in that space. The first was two months later in January, Radium by Formidable Labs was announced, which used uh, a new technique for doing CSS and JS where they had attached it to inline styles. So rather than the example I showed before where you inject the CSS into a style tag, they would attach style attributes, inline styles. Now. That has downsides that are hard to patch up because in inline styles can't have media queries, pseudo selectors, um, uh, a bunch of stuff you just can't do in inline styles. And so nowadays, five years later, we know that there's better approaches than what Radium did, but it was really important to explore that and to, to figure out whether that is a viable option or not. In February of 2015, Brent Jackson, one of my now coworkers at Gatsby uh, as of three months ago, built Rebase which uh, popularized the CSS components API, where you have a box component and a flex component that you can pass any kind of CSS to as a prop. And you can say box background color red as a prop, and it'll render a div with a background color of red. Rebase, still a great library, still used widely, has evolved over time to be really, really great. Um, highly recommend using it if you're using React. In May of 2015, uh, Glenn Mattern and uh, Mark Dargelich then announced CSS modules. Um, if you were around in the React uh, sphere around 2015, 2016, CSS modules was the big thing and still is a massive thing. It's still a great library. It's still a great technique to, to write CSS. Now, it has an asterisk next to its name because it's not technically CSS in JS because you're writing CSS in CSS files. So it's a great intermediary step. But what CSS modules really did and why it's on this list is because it popularized outputting unique class names, right? Suddenly people were considering the possibility that you don't actually have to come up with hundreds or even thousands of unique class names. You could just let a tool generate hundreds or thousands of unique class names and you would never have to deal with class name clashes ever again, which was incredible. In September of 2015, a tiny library was then released by Ryan Tao at Uber uh, called CS CSJS. Now, CSJS never really went anywhere. It's deprecated now and Ryan Tao has since built better libraries, but it was an important step along the way because it was the first library that made you write strings of CSS in JavaScript. So you could write actual CSS how you used to. Before CSJS, all of these CSS and JS libraries would make you write CSS as JavaScript objects. So you would write JavaScript objects and then write your CSS in JSON format, basically. And with CSJS, you could actually write your CSS how you used to, how you would normally write it in a .css file, which means, if, which obviously lowers the barrier to entry widely. Now again, CSJS didn't pick up much steam at the time and is now deprecated, but it was again, an important step along the way. 
In October 2015, Khan Academy got involved, a big education startup, and they launched their own CSS and JS library called Aphrodite. What Aphrodite really popularized is outputting critical CSS. The thing I talked about where we know which CSS you actually use on a page and that we only inject the most minimal CSS possible, Aphrodite basically came up with that, invented that, and figured out that that is even possible and made it work. And that was huge at the time. Now, Khan Academy still, and many other companies still use Aphrodite. It's still a great library, still developed, still getting better every single month. Uh, if you're using Aphrodite, if you're looking for a CSS and JS library, highly recommend it. In June of 2016, a couple of months later, we then got Fela, uh, which is a small independent library made by a Robin Frischman in Berlin also. I don't know why there's so many CSS and JS folks in Berlin. Kind of cool. I just now realized that. Uh, Fela really popularized this concept of your style being a function of state. If you've ever learned React, you will know that React is sort of built as your view is a function of state. And with Fela, we realized that your styles could also be a function of your state. It was the first library to really make this dynamic styling thing super easy to use and super possible and just amazing. Now, Fela, Robin is still working on Fela to this day. It's still a widely used library as well. Um, highly recommend using it. In July of 2016, we then got Glamour. Sunil Pai, who is now on the React team at Facebook, built his own CSS and JS library that sort of really focused hard on performance. And what he figured out is that there is a really unknown API in the DOM called CSS stylesheet.insert rule. Before Glamour, what we were doing is we were in, injecting a style tag into the DOM and then setting the style tags in our text to some CSS, which works but isn't very performant because it, it goes to the DOM, then the DOM parses your CSS, and then it sends it to the CSS DOM. So the browser has two things, the DOM document object model and the CSS DOM, the CSS object model, in case you didn't know. And by injecting into the DOM, we, were sort of, we sort of had to go through the DOM first before going into the CSS DOM. But insert rule is basically a CSS OM API where you can just insert CSS directly into the CSS DOM, bypassing the DOM entirely, which is obviously much, much faster because you're avoiding the parsing in the DOM and you just go directly to the CSS DOM. And so Glamour, Sunil discovered that API, realized it's literally 100,000 times faster than doing it the other way and made his own CSS and JS library. Nowadays, all CSS and JS libraries basically use this API. And here's a fun thing. Remember when I said that JSS from November of 2015, the very first CSS and JS library was way ahead of its time? Well, Oleg was using the insert rule API in November of 2014. And nobody else realized until Glamour came along. So Neil rediscovered the API and really popularized its usage. Now, Glamour is deprecated nowadays. Uh, Sunil has sort of moved on to other projects and um, other uh, CSS and JS libraries have superseded it. But it was a really important step along the way to really popularize this insert rule CSS on API uh, and make everybody much more performant. In October of 2016, we then got JSX style by Pete Hunt, who is one of the original creators of React at, at Instagram at the time, um, which took sort of the rebase CSS components API and made it even more uh, expansive and literally had a div component, a P component, an H1 component. Um, it was a different API that was similar to rebase, but different. And JSX style was widely used at, at the time. Nowadays, it's still maintained, but not that many people use it. It's sort of a minor library. It never really picked up that much steam. Um, so I would be a little bit cautious about using, using it, but it, it really proved that this CSS components API was something that could be improved upon and, and, and iterated upon. In October of 2016 as well, I stood on stage at React NL in, in Amsterdam. I can't believe that that is three and a half years ago. That is kind of incredible. Um, and I announced style components. Glenn Matter and the, one of the creators of CSS modules and I, uh, we had hung out in, in Australia and we came up with style components, which is what the library that I showed in the uh, example earlier. And we invented this sort of style.div API and style.h1 API, which it turns out with the benefit of hindsight, which is obviously 2020, people freaking loved. We had no idea if people would like it. Uh, nobody had ever done that before. We came up with it in a dark, shady whiskey bar in downtown Sydney. We're sitting there, sipping our whiskeys, talking about CSS, and came up with this weird API that we thought might be nice. And it turns out it's actually really nice, and people loved it. Um, style Components, obviously, is the best CSS and JS library. I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, it might or might not be, but a lot of people like it. A lot of people use it, like I said. Um, it's it's the, one of the most popular ones at the moment. In December of 2016, Ryan Tao, the guy who made CSS and CSJS, the earlier library with the strings of CSS, uh, who works at Uber, uh, released another library called Styletron. Uh, and Styletron is 
really, really honed in on this concept of outputting atomic classes. If you remember the example I showed you about style components, what we did is we hashed the entire block of CSS for every for sort of per component and injected a class name per component. What Styletron does, it, it, it takes every single CSS rule you write and it creates a class name per rule, atomic CSS, right? Which is just what that is, except it's automatic, so you don't have to write weird class names. It just outputs it like as, a, as an output compilation target, essentially, um, which is really beneficial for the performance of some applications, depending on how big your app is and how many unique styles you have, that can actually lead to an even bigger decrease in uh, CSS size, which is amazing. And Styletron, Uber uses it extensively. It's still widely used, still being maintained, still great, super fast as well. Highly recommend using it if you like uh, the API that it provides. In December of 2016 as well, we got styled JSX. The folks at site, uh, particularly Giuseppe, launched a CSS and JS library that had a really low barrier to entry. Essentially, you write a style tag in your JSX, and then those class names get uniquely fied, which is the most sort of the most familiar way of writing CSS out of all of these CSS and JS libraries, this is the most familiar or, or similar to how you would generally write CSS, which is fantastic for lowering the barrier to entry. If you ever used Next.js by any chance, this is what they ship by default because it has such a low barrier to entry, because it is so familiar. And again, great library, highly recommend using it if you like that API, still being maintained, still fast, still great. In March of 2017, we then got AstroTurf, um, where they introduced first class support for static CSS extraction. So you would write your CSS in JavaScript, but then they would extract it to a static CSS file at build time, which is completely weird. And nobody really considered doing before. And it turns out that actually has some nice properties. If you're building apps across multiple frameworks, if you have maybe a design system that is supposed to be used in React, but also in other frameworks, this lets you then distribute that CSS file more widely and sort of get the same benefits, but use it with many different frameworks, whatever your entire company uses. Now, also some downsides. Static CSS extraction is something that is useful for certain use cases, but not as great for other use cases. But AstroTurf as a library is still main, being maintained, is still great, um, and lots of people use it. In April of 2017, Kenzie Dodds, uh, whom you might know as the testing guy, the JavaScript testing guy, uh, who worked at PayPal at the time, launched Glamorous. And Glamorous, sort of took the styled components API, but made it possible to use it with CSS as objects, which was also an important step along the way because it showed us, the style components people, that some people really liked writing CSS as objects because Glamorous kind of took off. And then eventually we added support for uh, also writing CSS as objects optionally. And since then, Glamorous has been deprecated in favor of emotion and style components. But it was really important. It, it was an important step along the way for to show us that uh, people, some people really like writing CSS as, as objects. In May of 2017, I, I put style components v2 on, on this list, which is not actually the point. Style components v2 is not the point of this. But actually, what we discovered with version 2 is that a guy down in um, uh, Africa called Thai Sultan wrote a CSS parser in JavaScript. Before that, we were shipping post CSS to the browser which is massive bundle size-wise, like literally 50 kilobytes of JavaScript, min and gzip. Um, it's incredible. It's way too big. But we, we were sort of hacking together a first prototype and it worked. And then this random guy wrote this tiny, super fast and super correct CSS parser in JavaScript called Stylus. And we switched to that with V2 in May of 2017. And since then, basically all CSS and JS libraries have, have, have switched to using Stylus. And they're all now using Stylus because it's such a great, tiny, fast, correct CSS parser. It's, inc it's an incredible work of, of JavaScript. It's absolutely amazing. A huge shout out to Thai Sultan because without him, this would, like CSS and JS would only be a quarter as performant as it is nowadays. Then in July of 2017, we got Emotion, um, which really kicked off this still ongoing performance competition. Basically, Emotion came on the scene and was like, well, we're a CSS and JS library, and we're 50 times faster than every other CSS and JS libraries. So use us. And of course, all the other CSS and JS libraries went, oh, hold on. This thing is 50 times faster? Why is that? And then we all worked on making our own CSS and JS libraries faster. And nowadays, basically all CSS and JS libraries are the same speed. They're all super fast now. And the reason that is, is because Emotion really kicked off an ongoing performance competition. Uh, Emotion, again, great library, still a great library. I absolutely love those guys. Highly recommend using it. 
In September of 2017, we then got Linaria, which took that AstroTurf concept of popularizing of, of static CSS extraction and popularized it in combination with the style components API. So you, you could essentially write style components, but then extract it to a static CSS file. If that's the API you like, now you have the option of doing it with static CSS extraction, which is super big. Then a year and a little bit later in November of 2018, we got Emotion V10. And again, Emotion V10, the really important point is that they invented this CSS prop. So rather than sort of having CSS components or creating components outside of the render scope, you could write a CSS prop on any part of your JSX, put your CSS in there, and it would just work. And it would, again, inject it into the DOM, into style tag, attach a class name, a beautiful API that people had sort of considered before, but nobody really nailed, and they freaking nailed it. It's an amazing API that since then many other CSS and JS libraries have copied. Um, again, Emotion, great library. And then in June, half a year later of 2019, we got ThemeUI, which really popularized consistency via theming. They took that CSS prop API and built theming into it as a first class citizen. Now, as I just went through this entire list, you might have noticed something. I talk positively about all of these libraries, right? They're all amazing. All of these people are my friends. If you're in the React community, it might look like we're all fighting with each other and we're all sort of, we all hate each other. But that's actually not the case at all. I talk with all of those people frequently. We have a massive Twitter DM with literally 30, 40 people in it. And there's constant activity in there. And we're all pushing each other to just get better, invent more things, make our lives easier, right? Now, something else you might notice when looking at this list is that a ton happened in 2015, 2016, and 2017. And since then, it's kind of slowed down, right? So what is the future of CSS and JS? And what I really want to encourage you all to think about with this talk is that I don't know what the future of CSS is, right? I had an idea four years ago with Glenn when we were sitting in that shady whiskey bar in downtown Sydney, and we came up with an API that turned out some people liked. But we've sort of reached a plateau. Right? We're sort of at a local maximum. We're sort of at a point where people are content. But if you think about what's going to happen in 50 years, do I think we're still going to be writing style components? Hell no. I hope not. That would be really sad to me. Right? I don't want to be doing the same thing in 50 years because our industry moves way quicker and we've gotten so much better because of it. Right? We all push each other to get better as an industry as a whole. And it's why we, get, why we can be so productive. And sure, you can argue about the state of modern JavaScript. You can complain about NPM dependency. Hell. Sure, it's frustrating at times. But if you think about how we were creating websites 20 years ago compared to how we're creating websites today, it is so much nicer today. Literally, everything has gotten better, right? So if you think 10, 20 years down the line from now or even 50 years down the line from now, we got to make those quantum jumps again, right? We got we to gotta really keep moving on. We got to keep making better things. So what I'm really here to do is that I want to encourage you to think about creating the future of styling, not just React apps really, but anything, any kind of website, right? We're not done yet. We need to get somewhere. If you have an idea, try it out. If you think you have a better idea for how to style your apps, try it out, build it, make a prototype um, and use it in your apps and see if it works, see if you can make it work and then share it. Now, here's one last point that I want to make. I have some tips for how to creating, for how to create open source project, particularly in innovative ones that don't just iterate on old concepts. The first and really important point is make it work, then make it right, then make it fast, right? There's no point in building a library and focusing at the very beginning, if you're, if you're doing something innovative, focusing on making it the most performant library, because you don't even know if it's nice to use. You don't even know if people are going to like it. The first version we made of style components was a horrible hack. Like I said, we shipped post CSS to the browser, which is the stupidest idea you could, ever, you could ever have. That's not a good idea. But we needed a prototype, right? We had no idea if people were going to like the style components API or not. We had no idea if this was something that people were going to enjoy, whether we were even going to enjoy it ourselves, right? So we built a prototype and we tried it. And then as we got more feedback, we worked on making it right. Right? We shipped a better parser, a much smaller parser. We worked on performance. We added missing APIs. We cleaned up existing APIs that we didn't think through fully. We just made it much, much better overall. And then we worked on performance. Right? Then we worked on making the great API that we have fast. And that is the way you need to go with anything that is innovative and new because 
you have no clue if, it, if it's even a good idea until you've made it work, right? And then we can talk about making it right because making it right requires feedback. So you need to share early and share often, right? Get your thing out there. Talk about it on Twitter, at conferences, whatever, at meetups, at Bristol.js, for example. Talk about it. And what's going to happen is that people are going to give you feedback. They're going to come to you like they came to us with style components and tell you what a fucking dickhead you are. They're going to tell you what an idiot you are. They're going to ask you questions with, how do I do this? How do I do that? Why, do, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? You're going to get tons of feedback. And that's how you make something right. You take that feedback into consideration. You don't listen to everything. If somebody tells you you're an idiot, you probably don't have to listen to them. Okay? But some feedback is going to be valid. And you're going to notice things yourself. You're going to realize, oh, I don't actually know how to do this. Like, I need to add global styles. How do I do that if everything's scoped to component? Right? So you need to add an API for that. Um, and so this sharing early and sharing often is a great way to get a feedback loop going and work on making stuff right. And then the last and really important point is to document all the things because otherwise you're going to be bombarded with questions or people are just going to ignore your library because if they don't know how to do stuff, then they're not going to use your thing, right? Probably I would guess 80% of the time we spent on the very first style components release was on documentation making the website nice to use, writing really good documentation that covered everything you could do, how to do everything that you could normally do with CSS, with style components, literally documented all the things. That was may, way more work than coding the initial prototype, but it was super important because otherwise nobody would have used it. If they don't know how to use your thing, then they're not going to use your thing. Now, some people say, oh, but they can read the code. Yeah, but who reads code? Like, have you ever read the React source code? Of course not. You look at the React documentation. Why would you read the React source code? That doesn't tell you anything about how, how to properly use React or any other framework of your choice, right? The jQuery source. Like, almost nobody cares about how jQuery is implemented. What people care about is what, the, what it enables them to do. And the only way they know what it enables them to do is because it's so well documented and because it tells, tells you about it. So to summarize, uh, build the future. Right? Think about how you want to build websites. Think about how we could all be better as an industry overall. Not even just related to CSS, but to everything. Right? How do you want to build web apps? What is missing? What do you think is wrong? What could be better? And then once you do, focus on make it, making it work first, then make it right, then make it fast. Share it early and often and document all the things. That's all I have for you today. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed this talk. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>